are and, and tradition, it actually turns out to be one of the most powerful magic words um, available to these magicians that curse. I mean, when they sentence you, they're issuing a curse. They're issuing a spell. Yeah. What, what we've failed to realize is that we're dealing with people who, for a living, uh, uh, perform magic. And we've forgotten that, that, that everything about them is about staying in honour with their magic. If they lose their power of magic, they can't issue orders. That's why if they're in dishonour, a judge has to step down because their orders have no magical power right. under their system. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's actually the reason. And the proof is in the name of these societies. The word bar is a magic word in that what you see is one word, but really what you should be seeing is bar bar three times. That's what the, the, the word actually means. Bar 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 bar. That's what bar is. And bar bar means father in Hebrew and it means priest in Hebrew. That's interesting. And it particularly, and bar, bar, particularly means a Baal priest. A Baal priest. That's what it means. A yeah. Baal priest. Now, a Baal or Baal? Uh, well, Baal. Ba- Baal is two words. Uh, bar, uh, which is Lord, and then L. And the L is, is, uh, is abbreviated. So Baal with the apostrophe means Lord God. Yeah? Right. So, um, bar just on its own means Lord. So what you have uh, is the word bar also means uh, son of, as you've probably seen in Hebrew, like Simon bar Jonah, Simon son yep. of Jonah. Yeah, But it also yep. means practitioner of. So what you have is bar bar, practitioner of bar. Bar bar, practitioner of, abbreviated B-A-R, B, bar, A, um, by R Romanum. So practitioner of um, Baal through Rome. Yeah? Bar, another word for canon, rule, standard. Okay? Practitioner of Bar, practitioner of canon law. Yeah? They yeah, tell you. Yeah, one, one, one other use of uh, bar, bar, is the beginning of barbarians, which comes from the Greek, and it means that they, it, it's an er, uh, the people uh, spoke, a, uh, you know, in the manner that they spoke, it was un, not understandable, just like legalese. Yep. So they, that's where the word barbarian came from. And, of course, it's part of bar where they speak legalese, where only they can understand the words and we can't. Yes. Yeah. Right. So um, what we see in the word itself is, is a supremely powerful magic word um, that they are using to present themselves. And so they're really uh, telling people that they are Religious. The canon law tells that all courts are considered temples. That, that that's what the canon law is doing is is giving validation to the fact that the courts are called oratories and and it's in canon law and priests uh, not uh, judges of priests called ordinaries. Uh, but what the, what this is doing is validating what we're witnessing that um, the the judge leaving and returning um, is really changing. Uh, the form of the court to to more senior, more powerful um, uh, law. Um, it's showing that a judge is holding um, levels of power. It's showing that a judge is absolutely dripping in um, being a, a priest, a um, Baal priest, and that the authority of the judge and the ability to sentence is purely an ecclesiastical and sacramental power. It has nothing to do with uh, adjudication or agreement. Um, Their ability to judge and sentence is purely by remaining in honour of their ecclesiastical powers. So when you um, present an ecclesiastical notice of dishonour that... uh, uh, gives notice of dishonour by their rules, a judge loses their power. 
And it turns out that all this argument about liens and things that people have had for years, that, you know, if you get a lien on a judge, the judge has to leave, the lien means nothing. The lien is, 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 is irrelevant. What it, what's happening is when someone perfects that notice of protest and dishonour uh, to the point that it has some ecclesiastical power, the judge is screwed. Right. Now, the problem that remains is, is this, and we are getting, we're, we're draining the swamp to the point that in Pennsylvania now, there's no more pr- playing around. That They are holding firm to their claim of canon law, jurisdiction, but there's no more, there's no more misdirection or, 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 or fluff. We're down to the, you know, we, we see the white of their eyes, they see us, we know who they are, they, they don't quite know who we are. The canon law that we're doing now is the last, last thing. Once canon law is established for what it is, they cannot claim superior jurisdiction anymore. Right. But um, it, it, really, they once you can remove then their, rightfully remove their ecclesiastical power, their people are dead in the water. They, they can't do their job. Right. So you've disempowered them. Yeah. Well, that's... Their power, it turns out, is magic. Their power is if I can't curse you, then I can't do my job. And that's what a judge is supposed to do, is to issue judgments, and their judgments are curses. The curse establishes a debt. The debt is the monetization. That's what they do. Have you ever heard the, the, the have you ever heard of the, uh, the story in the New Testament about Jesus, um, uh, removing a hundred demons and then putting them into pigs and they jump off a cliff? Uh, that's not in my Bible. Okay, well, it's a, it's a, there's a, there's a story that, and it might only be in the the Vulgate, um, the Roman cults of Vulgate, but it, it's a story of Jesus uh, um, uh, banishing a hundred demons from a from a, a fellow and then putting them into the pigs and the pigs jump off the cliff. But the the, the point of the story is it demonstrates um, the uh, rebound of magic in terms of curses. So what it's implying is that that Jesus cursed the the demons, the demons then left the body, and then uh, uh, Jesus got the the, the demons into the pigs so that effectively the rebound wouldn't occur. There's actually a a quote, um, judge not lest ye be be judged, yes? Yep, yep. That should actually be curse not lest ye be cursed. Okay. (laughs) The Egyptians knew... And, and these people are magicians. Remember, they're sorcerers. They're into magic. The Egyptians knew that the most powerful spell is a curse spell. But the downside of a curse spell is when it matures, it returns with interest. Yeah? Right. So what they did was that they formed... Have you seen the mummification of animals? Yep. Now, we've, we've, we've totally misunderstood why they went to the extent of mummifying animals. But what the Egyptians worked out is they could protect uh, a king from the afterlife of anyone putting curses by basically putting in um, substitutes um, and blessing those substitutes so that any curses would go to the substitute. It's a bit like, you know, fight, modern fighter planes will um, let off flares. Yes. The missile will think the flare is the, is the plane, Right. Well, right. think the missile is the curse coming back, right? Yep. If you don't have a flare, what's going to happen to, to the plane? It's going to get nailed. That's right. Well, that's, that's exactly what happens with curses, right? Now, uh, in voodoo, uh, the voodoo priests put um, bugs and little animals, depending upon the, the seriousness of the curse, in jars. Have you ever seen the... I don't know if you've ever seen a documentary, but the you ever see a voodoo priest's got prayer room, you know, it's full of jars, right? And what they do is when they curse, they'll put the, the, the rebound of the curse at, what they'll do is they'll, as they're doing the curse, they'll have the animal and the jar, and when they're finished, they'll put the jar away so the jar becomes responsible, not the priest, yeah? Right. Interesting. Now, the Roman cult with the Venetians under Medici came up with a different plan. They used money. Debt money, debt, right? Yes. So money became the currency of curses, right? Yes. 
it meant that all the curses that they've done um, will never mature so long as the money system continues to exist, right? Right. And so long as the debt's never matured, they don't get in trouble. I'm just going to take this call, guys. Give me one sec. That's some pretty deep stuff. Yeah, it's a lot of deep stuff, that's for sure. It's from the inside. Yeah, it's still uh, deep stuff. It's, I've heard of the judges going to, the, to learn the craft. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I took that to being, you know, wizardry of words and that sort of thing. There's well, it's, way beyond that. it's no different than them doing hocus pocus and turning a cookie into Christ, eh? <laughs> I suppose. Well, it it really is the same kind of stuff. It's just like the judge running in and out of the courtroom. He's transmutating himself into a different position. Right. It's almost like a death and a resurrection. Mm-hmm. Well, he if he needs more power, he goes back and and uh, kicks himself up a notch. How did the cook put that? Kick it up a notch. No doubt, this is a. Uh, they've had the experience of doing this for a very extremely long time. In terms of time. Well, the, the bastards have been getting away with it for two thousand years, eh? Um, but uh, fig- figuring out how exactly that they pull off their jurisdiction and they every and get everybody to um, to swallow it, <clears throat> it's just like money. Um, money only has a value if everybody believes it's valuable. If the yeah. whole world would only accept seashells as currency, uh, then the currency would be seashells, right? Yeah. You know, That's right. Uh, trying somebody try to give me a piece of paper and say you nuts I want seashells you know nothing else is valuable so it, it doesn't matter if it's gold it's a, gold is still an illusion and of course um, you heard about what the IMF did to the Reserve Bank of India about a year ago uh, nope they sold them 200 tons of tungsten with four microns of gold plating on it <laughs> for full price. Now, if you if you read the uh, incorporation documents of the IMF, you will find that they can't be sued by anybody or anything on the planet. So, what recourse does the bank have? They got to fill up their drill holes and tell everybody it's gold. Bunch of cheats, eh? Well, uh, it's like you said about the monopoly game. You know, they own the board. They own the, all the pieces, they own the bank, and they make the rules, and they change the rules, and on top of it all, they cheat. <laughs> yeah. hey, the rules for us, not for, for you, not for us. <laughs> hey, Vic? Yes? Uh, one, of the, one of the things that Frank was going to before he left was that when these judges come into court because of that money being a curse, these judges will not come into the chambers with any money in their possession while they're there on the job. Is that right? Yeah. They'd be coming in with their own curse, I guess, eh? It's coming back to them. Right. Yeah, the the other one on that, Vic, is um, uh, if you read Catholic canon law, uh, all the priests uh, take a vow of poverty, eh? Yes. Okay, how come the cardinals are all billionaires? That well, doesn't I've sound very... What's it? You've always wondered that? They never but, touch the but, money. If you don't have any money in your pocket, you must be poor, right? That's correct. their that's their trick on the vow of poverty. They never touch it. It's never in their pocket, so therefore they're poor. Yeah, I knew that they were doing for the money. They're not real. Uh, they're real religious guys, but. Uh... I had no idea of the, of the money being a curse from their perspective in that sense. It is a curse in anybody's well, actually, hands for that matter. Yeah, actually how that got developed was really understanding how bills of exchange work. They're really quite incredible. I happened to uh, come across um, some old books that were published in um, approximately 1907. So the the information is from about 1905 to 1906. 
Uh, you can find them up on the internet. They're called the Harmsworth.